We are delighted to have with us today Russ Stedrake. Russ is the Toyota professor at MIT in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Mechanical Engineering, and AeroAstro. Uh, he is also the Vice President of Robotics Research at Toyota Research Institute. Uh, he was the leader of the MIT entry in the DARPA Robotics Challenge. He is the recipient of numerous awards and honors that I will not list today. I just thank uh, Russ very much for agreeing to speak to us today. And Russ will talk about motion planning around obstacles with convex optimization. Russ, please. Thank you, Dan. Let me um, do one quick administrative thing here. So I've just pasted a link in the slides. If you prefer, uh, I've learned over Zoom that if I share this link, you can open up my slides directly in your browser. They'll advance when I advance, but my robot videos will play at full frame rate in your browser because it will download directly to your browser. And even the 3D animations will be a 3D visualization directly in your browser. So it's a slightly nicer experience if you choose to do it that way. You're welcome to learn to watch just on Zoom um, as normal. <laughs> okay, I do, thank you um, for the introduction. I, I do wanna tell you about some new work we've been doing about doing motion planning with convex optimization, which. I hope sounds a little surprising, um, and uh, I'll try to tell you the details of, of that particular set of algorithms. Um, <clears throat> it's captured in two papers. One of them is an optimization paper, which is a more general framework, shortest path in graphs of convex sets. I hope you understand well what that means by the end of the, of the lecture. <clears throat> and then there's a, a more specific um, realization of that, a transcription of the motion planning problem into the graph of convex sets framework, which I'll tell you some details about today too. This is joint work. Tobia is a student who's, who finishes PhD soon. Jack is a um, was a postdoc. He just started at Oxford. Pablo is a, a senior faculty optimization guru that I will refer to a few times in the talk. Someone told me before that it sounded like I was talking about Pablo as a student. But Pablo is a is my senior, um, so I'll make that clear. Okay, so the goal of the work is to do motion planning. That's one goal. In particular, um, a, maybe an aggressive version of that goal is to try to have efficient algorithms for admittedly approximate but global optimization based planning, <clears throat> including dynamic constraints. So that's kind of all of the things we might want maybe. Um, in particular, it's motivated by some studies we've been doing over the years of trying to understand how to plan through rigid body contact and some of the hardness that comes from the discontinuous um, landscapes that you get from those problems. But today I'm gonna to tell you the first version of it, which is really focused more on the collision-free motion planning and the transcription into the machinery that I think will go the distance. <clears throat> but more at a higher level, um, I think there's, there's a lot of good work in trajectory optimization. There's a lot of good work in sample-based planning and geometry. But there's also a lot of good work in AI style logical planning, which scales um, incredibly well. And there's really good work on combinatorial optimization. And they're all, they all somehow must be talking about the same truth. But I think we often use very different languages. Um, and, and one of the goals of this work is to try to make some of the deeper connections between these different toolkits. I hope that is clear during the course of the talk too. Okay, so how when you think about global optimization, you might think about, for instance, the RRT star algorithm as a way to um, get asymptotically optimal global plans in a motion planning problem. And that is true, and it's a powerful framework. Um, but RRT star in practice, um, you know, takes a long time to converge to, to good solutions and doesn't handle dynamic constraints very well. That's a place where trajectory optimization has traditionally done exceptionally well. This is a nonlinear trajectory optimization that solves very quickly um, local optimal trajectories for walking, running, or trotting in a quadruped. And that just comes out of a simple optimization, beautiful dynamically feasible motions that would be hard to get out of a, you know, RRT star kind of algorithm. But, re, you know, but then this, this doesn't have any global properties. It doesn't have any asymptotic optimality, certainly, and it in practice gets stuck in local minima. So the hope is that we can get some of the best of both worlds. And in particular, we're gonna ask trajectory optimization problems 
to solve you know harder motion planning problems that have non-trivial local minima you know like finding the the path from a start to a goal in a maze for instance and is there any hope of trajectory optimization working well in these kind of problems so i want to tell you that story i want to start a little um carefully by just laying out the basic optimization framework about if we were to cast the motion planning problem as a trajectory optimization what does it traditionally look like? How are we going to change that? Okay, so the simplest um, example I will give, will just as a to, to storyboard, really, is just let's say I'm going to take uh, a sim simple point robot, move it from a start to a goal around some polygonal obstacle. Okay, um, if I want to formulate that as a trajectory optimization, you have many choices, but maybe one of the simplest would be to just make Addition, decision variables in my optimization problem for various points along the trajectory. I'll call those X, N. Maybe I'll penalize the total um, path length, or this is a little weird to do the, the squared length instead of the, the actual distance, but that's a common choice in the trajectory optimization world to do a quadratic cost instead of and avoid the square root, okay? Subject to some, so these are my decision variables, these different points on the path. And I'm going to put a constraint, I'll do constrained optimization, a constraint that the initial condition is at the start, the final condition is at the goal. And then I'm going to add one additional, you know, seemingly simple constraint, but that's a collision avoidance constraint, which in the case of a box is very simple to write. I'm just going to say it's outside the L1 ball. Now that, of course, is a very non-convex constraint and causes local minima to happen in my problem. Okay, so we'll 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 study this and we'll try to improve upon it. But another thing before I before we get too far, one of the things that it's worth noting about this is that these transcriptions have something that I've always disliked, which is that they preordain a fixed number of samples in the solution trajectory. I've always thought the sample-based planners were better in that regard. You didn't have to say a priori how many steps it takes to get to the goal. And I think having to make that choice causes some some false hardness in the optimization landscape. Okay, if I write this um, problem down and give it to an optimizer, the optimizer can solve this incredibly quickly, um, but it's subject to the non-convexity and therefore local minima. So I didn't bother to take out the, the, the in-between samples point in the simple example, but if I just solve this, it solves at interactive rates. This is just a little animation of me um, moving the initial condition and the final condition around and it found quickly a solution that went to the right around the box. But even if I move the initial condition over here and the final condition and the goal over here, once it's decided itself um, to go right around the box, it will never stop and flip to the solution that's left around the box, even though it's clearly a shorter path here, right? Because it's stuck in a local minima and it would have to, the, those objectives and constraints would have to get worse in order to traverse through the box to the other solution. So any gradient-based approach here is gonna get stuck in that local minimum. So we wanna resolve that issue. And we've done, um, we've, we've made progress in it. So just as a quick preview of the results. So this is an example, which if you're in your, um, your own browser, you have a little 3D animation that you can, you can play with, you can mouse around. And if you open the controls and hit play, you'll see this is a quad rotor subject to dynamic constraints. What I've done here is I plotted two trajectories with two different costs. One is minimizing time, one is minimizing effort, and it takes two different paths, but it's solving to global optimality through an obstacle field. And that's just solved in a heartbeat with the new algorithms. Um, but it gets more interesting than that if I make now the quad rotor try to fly through more complicated mazes subject to its dynamic constraints. We can solve that problem. Um, I'll, I'll be careful to talk about the gaps between the true optimal solution and the, the approximal, but in the class of curves that we are considering, we're finding the global optimal problem uh, very quickly. I'm personally very excited about applying this to motion planning that is with robotic arms and complicated manipulation settings. So this next animation is two KUKAs. So it's a 14 dimensional configuration space with complicated configuration space obstacles. So the, the geometries of these KUKAs are, are complex. And we've put them in a situation where the start and the goal basically 
asks them to play Twister in order to move the mugs around. And you might not, I mean, I didn't think that this would be a, um, a problem that would be very amenable to convex optimization, but we have now convex optimization solutions that are working very well in that setting. And they work on real robots. So we're starting to get really beautiful motions in very little computation for you know, real robots dancing around each other to some extent, um, you know, coming closer to the optimal motions that they're capable of. What is optimized here? Yeah, so in most cases, it's the path length. Okay. Path or some combination of length and time sometimes. If we, um, we either do time subject to velocity constraints, if those are the active limits, or just total path length in the joint space. Okay. I'll show you exactly what can be optimized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it sounds a little bit like snake oil or something, the way I've been saying it so far, So, but it's, it's really very simple. Um, and I'll tell you the steps. Um, there's kind of three key ingredients. One is just remembering a well-known result from, from, um, from uh, graph flows, right, of, of how to solve uh, the linear programming formulation of the shortest path problem on a discrete graph and asking how that relates to the motion planning problems we've been solving. Combining that with convex formulations that we know well of for continuous motion planning in the case that we don't have obstacles or we have known, we've already made a choice about which way to go around an obstacle. For instance, that's what people have been doing, uh, like VJ and others have done in quad rotors. Um, and then there's one other big step is to do approximate convex decompositions of configuration space. And when you put all those together, then we have some results that I, I'm very excited about. Okay, so let's just think about the, the mixed integer. I'll build that up. With first by thinking about the mixed integer convex formulation of motion planning and the way people have done it uh, in the cases where they've chosen to solve the harder combinatorial version of the problem. Okay, so we take our same problem formulation where we have the same decision variables, the same um, initial conditions and constraints. This is all convex so far, but the uh, non-convex non-collision constraint, we're gonna write it differently this time. We're gonna write it as a disjunctive constraint uh, a, a dis disjunctive, um, you know, linear constraint. So we'll say either I'm outside of this face, or I'm outside of this face, or for each of these sample points, are outside of you know this face or this face or this face or this face, right? So that would be a disjunctive program, a disjunctive constraints, and it could be transcribed into a mixed integer convex optimization problem. And we've known how to do that well for a long time. And if you do that, you can solve at interactive rates the global optimality the original problem in these small scales. But we'll see that the performance of this doesn't scale to bigger problems. <clears throat> just to understand a little bit why, I'll just remind you for, for the, just I, I have to make sure that I bring people up if they don't know mixed integer, some of you will know it very well and I apologize. But um, if I think about a mixed integer problem and what makes it work well or not, the mixed integer problem class of problems <clears throat> would be considered mixed integer convex if my costs and my constraints are all convex functions and I'm subject to some, and this is a mixed binary, right? Uh, uh, I'm gonna say that I've got some decision variables that are subject to being either zero or one, okay? And then we'll talk about the convex relaxation of a mixed integer problem when we replace this hard zero or one constraint with zero, putting B between zero and one. That would be the convex relaxation of a mixed integer convex problem. And we'll talk about a convex relaxation being tight when the, the relaxed solution with this gives a solution to the original problem. So if I solve the relaxed solution and I get Bs that are all zeros or ones, then I would say that the convex relaxation is tight and I can just solve the convex problem and get the global solution. The way we then solve these mixed integer problems in practice is with a branch and bound algorithm, most typically, <clears throat> um, where we start by looking at just the convex relaxation, we get some solution, which may or may not have integer feasible um, uh, solutions. 
and then we'll branch and we'll, we'll make a hard decision saying, okay, well, B might have been zero, it might have been one. And now I get a new convex problem with a, additional constraints and I can proceed through the branch and bound tree and guarantee that in a finite number of, of problems, I will get a globally optimal solution. And in practice, I can only solve a small subset of that potential tree because of the, the, the fact that the convex relaxations provide lower bounds of entire solution trees and feasible solutions provide upper bounds, therefore making this, in the best cases, a very efficient uh, search of the combinatorial space. Okay, in practice, if you look about like how well these mixed integer problems solve, it's subtle, right? So um, of course it scales with the size of the tree, which goes like the number of integer variables, but it also grows, you know, it, the performance is highly tied to the tightness of the convex relaxation because you'd like the convex relaxation lower bounds and upper bounds to be close. Therefore, you would allow, allow you to discard large parts of the search tree very quickly. Okay. So when I take those motion planning transcriptions that I told you about before, <clears throat> in practice, they are making way too many integer variables, like um, not just capturing what I would consider to be the true combinatorial complexity of going left or right around the tree, but for every decision variable, independently we're deciding, am I going right around the box or left around the box? And that's adding this false combinatorial complexity, adding lots of integer variables and suffering terrible performance. And the way that we write those convex relaxations or the, the, the obstacle avoidance constraints with disjunctive programming is sort of fundamentally gonna give loose relaxations. And I can, you can sort of see why um, in the, I'll, I'll give an example in the next slide here, but um, in practice, we get very long solve times in these solutions to the point where they don't scale. This is the convex relaxation that you solve for that problem. If I solved it through the mixed branch and bound to optimality, it gives me the optimal solution. But if I just solved the first step of the branch and bound, then the convex relaxation, you know, the, the relaxation of the disjunctive constraints, which say go a, a one side around each obstacle, just goes right through the obstacle. So it, it, it's not only loose in terms of lower bound and upper bound, but it's just not capturing the essence of the problem. So Pablo, again, not my student, <laughs> this is my, my senior, um, in a conversation, uh, he, you know, we were, I, was, I was talking to the, this problem out with him, and he just asked exactly the right question. Um, we we spent long times collaborating. Um, he said, well, hold on. We know that the LP formulation of the shortest path on a discrete graph has a tight convex relaxation. We only solve the convex optimization there. So why exactly are you writing, are your... So um, formulations so loose. So that's a fair question. We should figure that out. We started looking more more carefully, and it turns out we were just writing. I mean, I, the, you know, the field has sort of been writing those problems down wrong. I think. Then there's a better way that's cl more closely connected to the LP formulations, and it makes a huge difference. So I'll remind you the LP formulation of the shortest path, and show you now how to write the motion planning problem in a way that's more similar to that and leverages the strength. So the traditional shortest path, if I have um, you know, a source and a target on a discrete graph, this is a directed graph with edges uh, that have a cost, a scalar cost associated with them, uh, Cij. I'm gonna assign decision variables, phi, for every edge from edge from node i to node j. And I'm gonna ask them to be zero one variables where it, the edge is one if that edge is a part of the optimal path, the shortest path. Otherwise, it should be zero. Okay, so then I can write the total path length as just the weighted combination. These are constants and these are linear. So it's a linear objective in those binary variables that for the path length. I put in flow constraints saying the total number of flows coming into some node equals the flows coming out of that node. It's just a clever way to encode that it's either this this is either visited or not visited. We'd expect those sums to either be zero or one. The deltas are just to handle the source and the target as special cases. And then there's the, um, the constraint that the, the binary variables are either zero or one, but it turns out that if I relax that to, to just being between zero and one, and in this problem, we can actually just say it's greater than zero, 
that's sufficient. The, the flow constraints constrain it to be less than one. Then we have the binary relaxation of this problem. And it, it's well known that this binary relaxation, the, the, the convex relaxation is binary feasible. It solves the, the mixed integer problem to global optimality. So here's the extension that we are making now to that general framework, which is to take the, the graph search problem and turn it into a graph of convex sets. Okay, so the machinery goes like this. For each, so for a general graph problem, we're gonna generalize this, the statement to say that every time I visit a vertex V or, or I here, I guess, <clears throat> I'm, I get to choose one element out of a convex set. A continuously a continuous variable element from a convex set, and so that'll be a point x i in the set, for instance. I'm going to generalize my notion of edge length to be a convex function of the lengths between the continuous variables. And so the now the length of an edge is, is allowed to be a continue a co convex function of the continuous variables. Okay, and um, this is now you should think of these as like islands that I'm hopping between. This is not obstacles in the motion planning problem. I'll tell you the connection there. This is just a general graph search problem with some continuous components brought in. And it turns out to be a formulation that we can write strong optimizations against, and it's a very general formulation. In particular, it's pretty easy to see how the shortest path on a graph can be generalized to the shortest path on graphs of convex sets. The, this is the classic shortest path I just told you about. Now I'm gonna, I have, I had originally had fixed costs of the edges. Now I have a um, convex function that's an edge length. This looks bad because I've got a, um, I've got a, what looks like a non-convex um, cost function. But in fact, um, the non-negative scaling of a convex set is still convex. We tend to use perspective functions to realize that, but this is still okay. And the rest of the problem looks almost identical, but we have a new constraint that we're allowed to choose Xi from the, the convex set as we traverse the graph. With a little bit more, so this, if solved, so this loses the property, the convex relaxation is not guaranteed to be tight, but if we solve this as a mixed integer optimization, we can solve the global optimality and get our, um, get our results. And that already achieves more orders of magnitude speed ups on the original motion planning instances. <laughs> but what was really important was um, looking for ways to further tighten the convex relaxation. Okay, so Tobia, the uh, student, um, he continued to study the convex relaxation on simple graphs, understood very carefully when the relaxation was tight, when it was loose. Um, Pablo saw at least a few places where the convex relaxation was loose. And it was actually very interesting working with him on this because he says, you know, he has this um, understanding of optimization, maybe belief in optimization. He says things like, come on, if, the, if, if I can as a human come up with a, with a tighter lower bound, then clearly the LP should be better than me. If I, can, if I can come up with a trivial lower bound that your optimization isn't getting, then you're missing a constraint. Okay, and so we did, we've iterated and iterated and found sort of the missing constraints. And they look like these strengthening constraints, which are, are well understood in optimization and various like um, RLT, if you know the reformulation linearization techniques or other approaches where you add additional constraints, which don't change the optimal solution, but they can add strength to the relaxed solution. So they look like redundant constraints if you were binary feasible, but when you're in relaxed problems, they are adding strength to the relaxation. And one of the particularly interesting ones was to say, we had the original conservation of flow on the graph problem, and now we have a spatial conservation of flow. So we have these extra decision variables lying around saying that the, um, there's a con continuous variable that um, associated with my decision in the set. And if we force those to turn on and off with the spatial flow constraints, this adds nothing to the binary feasible solution, but it adds a lot of strength to the relaxation. And we've sort of gone in and understood the cost benefit trade-off of adding each type of these constraints. We found a sweet spot 
where a relatively small number of constraints adds a lot of strength to the optimization. We're not in, we're not adding exponential number of constraints. They're only polynomial or even linear numbers of constraints. They add a lot of strength to the optimization. This was the most important, I think, missing constraint. So now we're able to recast the motion planning problem as a graph of convex sets, okay? So um, instead of having a discrete decision in a fixed number of steps along the way, we're gonna break up the problem saying, I could go left or right around the obstacle, which in my, sense, my mind is a much more correct expression of the combinatorial hardness of this problem. And we're gonna associate a vertex with each of those decisions. And then we're gonna use the graph of convex sets machinery in order to cast that as a mixed integer problem. And now um, we can again solve the global optimality for these simple problems in interactive rates, but, um, but that is also the convex relaxation. Now the convex relaxation actually solves the global optimality in these instances, and we'll see it solves in many harder instances too. That's actually just solving the convex relaxation. So now the convex relaxation is capturing the essence of the problem. So if I go back to our maze example, um, from a start to a goal, finding a continuous curve through the map, through the path subject to derivative constraints or other interesting constraints, I can solve this as a graph of convex sets problem. And um, this is the convex relaxation, it's tight. So if you're thinking of this as a graph search problem, you should think that's a trivial problem, but this is more than a graph search problem. This is a continuous path optimization problem. You should think of it as a Euclidean shortest path problem and that's being solved to global optimality with a convex relaxation. Um, and the previous, this is a simple toy example in some sense, but previous formulations would have been absolutely intractable in terms of the number of binary variables and you couldn't even hand it to a solver. So just since many of you probably know the Euclidean shortest path problem well, I'll just make the connections, right? So the famous Euclidean shortest path problem is solvable in polynomial time in 2D with a visibility graph, for instance, and be hard in three, from three dimensions on. There's good approximation algorithms which give you an optimality in 3D. And I, I don't believe we know things for 4D or, or beyond. If you know otherwise, I'd love to hear it. And we're not breaking those hardness results in any way. What we are saying is we have a polynomial time algorithm, which includes dimensions greater than four. And only we're saying that it's often tight, right? So we're solving a more general class of problems. We can also have dynamic constraints and <clears throat> the certificates are, are different. They are, we can tell, I'll tell you more about the certificates, but in practice, it's a very, in many instances, we get optimal solutions, but we, we know that we will not always because the problems are in hard. There's a couple nice things to know about it. So um, if you take our formulation, shrink the sets back down to points, then it recovers the original LP formulation, which is known to be tight. That's kind of a sanity check. We didn't break the goodness of the LP formulation, um, but we do know that there are instances of this problem that are NP hard. The, um, you know, the trend, the uh, reduction to, to the Hamiltonian path problem is in the, the case where the sets completely overlap and you could have a cost function that forces you to visit every set. Um, the interesting cases are the real uh, motion planning transcriptions, which are somewhere in the middle, and we don't have hardness results yet. Um, we can definitely give simple examples where the relaxation is not tight, but we give many examples where it is. Interestingly, because we're using this optimization framework, we can add dynamic constraints to the problem too. So it can start handling um, derivative constraints on the, on the paths and uh, even dynamic constraints. So we did this initially, we had done some work on mixed integer footstep planning for humanoid robots. And this solved our original problem instances just much, much better. The, the lower bounds were um, went from being almost vacuous of the convex relaxation to being quite strong. And in practice, it was orders of magnitude faster solution times than our methods and other people that have been solving mixed integer uh, versions of this problem. Question. Of course, please. Um, I, I, uh, one of the works of you that I know talks about uh, going beyond the co collision avoidance constraints and maybe talking about like softer kind of considerations. 
does this kind of approach can be kind of adapted to work with those as well? Okay, very nice. So um, for instance, some of uh, we have a different approach to like planning through contact where we're, we're softening the constraints explicitly. We're doing randomized smoothing and the like. I think those are so far parallel, but different efforts. This one, we're actually embracing the hardness of the, of the combinatorial. And then we're asking about approximation algorithms of that hard result. Um, so they're different, two different approaches, I think, to the same problem. I see them as two parts of my brain. But even if in the setting that you just described, you can also think of this as being, you know, you can have like a smoother cost function and maybe integrating that into the kind of setting that you presented, maybe like a weighted kind of uh, version or? Absolutely. So so I think I think both um, are, are interesting approaches. The, I see the, so rounding discontinuities in some sense, so it gives us the ability to write distance metrics and to make more approximate methods work or trajectory optimization work better, but it in some ways hides the real combinatorial complexity of the problem. So, so we're this in this line of work, we're actually trying to just expose the combinatorial complexity and bring the proper combinatorial optimization tools to bear. And it's more focused on the global optimization. The smoothing is more like, let's do local optimization as well as we possibly can. Thank you for asking. Okay, let me tell you the transcription from of the motion plotting problem to graph of convex sets. Okay, so the blue regions, my islands, are now going to be a convex decomposition of the free space of the configuration of free space. The red in this case is now my obstacle. If I have a start to, and a goal, then I'm going to make a discrete graph based on when the decomposition of my configuration space has any intersection. Okay, so I'll make a uh, an edge between these two um, sets as long as they overlap, and even a measure zero overlap is fine. And then I'm going to de write decision variables associated with each of those sets, which encode a continuous curve in the optimization. Okay, we are using Bezier curves um, just to exploit their convex hull property and ensure that we have collision avoidance, but you could make other choices there. Um, and then at optimality, if the edge is in the shortest path, we also have put constraints, which we, we think of as just um, cost functions with infinite uh, cost if, if the constraint is not uh, satisfied, which then enforce continuity conditions on the curves. There's some details in order to have time rescaling. We also have an additional spline, an additional set of decision variables that encodes a time rescaling for each segment. All of these get turned on or off. So the decision variables here um, that associate with the curves here effectively get turned off by the by the binary variables at the optimal solution. So to, to answer Dan's question, we can handle scalar, any scalar of the total duration of the trajectory, of the path length, of the path energy, if you want some sort of smoothness. These are the constraints. We have regularizations for acceleration in other terms, but these are the ones that we focus on is our sort of formulation. You can put continuous derivative constraints on the curves. You can have strict collision avoidance in, with using the Bezier um, polynomials. We we can say we can guarantee for all t, not just at some sample points of collision avoidance. We can put strict velocity constraints on. We actually can't put acceleration constraints on while we're doing the time rescaling. That's non-convex. Um, we can put bounds on, on time, initial condition, final condition, these kind of things. This is kind of the formulation we've dialed in, which we think is a useful class of planning problems, which we can solve very well in this formulation. And if you look at the maze kind of problems, it's interesting, we, we grabbed a bunch of mazes online and had to change them because they all have like a unique solution. <laughs> and so we had to, to blow some holes through the walls to make it interesting and have multiple solutions. And then once you do that, um, you can, you know, if you change your objective, you get different solutions that will make different choices, find different paths. And that's all being solved with the convex relaxation. Here's Dan. So two spheres in a plane, right? Um, uh, I, I, we threw this up together last night. Uh, we can solve that. So this is, uh, you know, 50 polyhedral faces approximation of spheres to make the convex sets. Um, you know, we can handle the, the sort of it more interesting cases. I know you have analytical solutions for the, the case um, with no obstacles, but of course we can handle the case. Actually, the polygons are easier for us than the spheres. Um, 
so that that kind of works and it works fine with uh, you know with more spheres too so this is the you know the three spheres kind of interesting uh cases <clears throat> so again what we're giving and I'll, we'll talk about the gaps but we're giving um not they're certainly not closed form they're numerical approximations they are global within the class of curves the gaps come from our our convex cover of the free space and the choice of a degree of the polynomial that has to fit inside the, the each region so there are some gaps but these should be fairly tight numerical approximations of the optimal solution right so it's a transcription to a mixed integer convex program but with a very tight convex relaxation so if you want to solve to global optimality with branch and bound you can it will work orders of magnitude faster than previous work but what's exciting is that actually you often don't have to um we can sort of shed the the dependency on the expensive convex or mixed integer solvers commercial solvers solve only the convex optimization and then do a little bit of rounding to get uh, it's almost always sufficient for to obtain globally optimal solution now elon would say um performance bounds are missing and absolutely he's right our emphasis has been on approximate algorithms that scale very well i think there's interesting work to be done to try to give rigorous bounds although i don't expect um we're, we're we're in a class of problems that i think the worst case bounds we know are bad um and what's more interesting to me is sort of statistical bounds on the instances that come from real motion planning problems which is a slightly different statement so what we've done is instead looked at like generating procedurally huge numbers of environments for quadrotors to fly through and asking questions about um for instance how often is the convex optimization achieving the true minimal um cost uh and you can talk about the the optimality gap and when, in most instances in the quadrotor cases it's solving to, the, to optimality and there's another sort of statistical measure we can ask which is for all these instances how often does the convex relaxation know is it able to certify that the optimality gap so if the lower bound and the upper bound of the and the, the the rounded solution give the same values then the the convex relaxation can certify optimality without doing any additional work and that's a you know you have that happening less but even the worst cases it it guarantees that you're within 20 percent of the optimal solution in those examples so that's our statistical evidence okay but there's a really good problem that I think any geometry folks are probably wondering about which is um isn't decomposing configuration space for robots hard yes um but we've been making progress on that and it's been more productive than I might have guessed the our approach to it is fast approximate decomposition uh, convex decompositions and it started actually just in um in Euclidean spaces where we just said um even when we were working with raw sensor data we wanted fast algorithms for finding big convex regions this was for footstep planning originally and we came up with algorithms that would alternate between relatively large scale quadratic programs and relatively compact semi-definite programs which would basically find separating hyperplanes between the obstacles and a sample point and then try to grow the largest contained ellipse as our metric of volume and then alternate in order to use the ellipsoidal metric to find the closest planes and we would we have quick filling of large um, configuration space certified free regions um and we used that before to do um trajectory planning where the in the euclidean space you would do an initial decomposition by just sampling now every time i do a sample we're gonna we're gonna pull a, a you know do a little extra work to compute these convex regions and then we would do we'll solve our trajectory optimization with curves to be constrained to side to lie in these regions Okay. Um, <clears throat> in general, once we've now moved to trying to do this in configuration space, we have all of the complexity of the very non-convex configuration space obstacles. Um, and we've got we've introduced two new extensions of that. 
One of them, which we started working with immediately, was just they had no guarantees, but we would use nonlinear optimization to try to do sort of to try to find counterexamples with a nonlinear optimizer that would provide the certification the quadratic program was originally providing. And that scales well and gave us great regions, but has no guarantees. And now we've done a much more rigorous version of that using sums of squares and polynomial optimization, which I'll tell you in a few slides about. So um, Dan saw this at, at Wafer, and we have a journal version, which is much more complete uh, coming out at the end of this month about how to do the approximate decompositions, finding these big regions um, in configuration space. But the idea is pretty simple. We're going to assume that the task-based geometries are convex, or they've been doing a approximate or doing a convex decomposition in task space seems much more reasonable assumption. And then we're going to formulate the problem of trying to find a separating hyperplane in task space, okay, which is a well understood problem. But we're going to do that certification in the in the joint space. So how do we do that? So in the original um, problem. Uh, we can just find a, a certification saying that I have some configuration space um, joint angles Q. I have the body that is in some space, some um, frame, and it has some some points here through the kinematics for Q of this convex body. And I will find a separating hyperplane for it that, for instance, says that these points are on one side of the hyperplane, these points are on the other side of the hyperplane, and my decision variables are just to find the coordinates of that separating hyperplane. We can, I'll write that just a little bit differently like this. I'll move the minus ones to the other side, but it's the same thing. Now, the interesting case is if I want to find, consider many cues, how do I do that? Well, now finding a single separating hyperplane that works for many configurations proved to be way too conservative. So what we do is we find a parameterized separating hyperplane, which is a function of the configuration space variables Q, and we search for certificates that for any for all Q inside my my polygon approximation of free space that for every Q there is a, a parameterized hyperplane okay if I use rational polynomial um, descriptions of the kinematics uh, then I can turn this into a polynomial uh, inequality uh, I can use the s procedure and 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 strong results from, from polynomial optimization to cast this as a sums of squares optimization. And we're able to solve this um, pretty effectively. So in practice, even when we have um, you know, a dual arm manipulator, so configuration spaces that are, that are uh, high dimensional, we're able to find large configuration space regions. And even though they're, we're using fixed degree polynomial certificates, we're able to find pretty close, um, tight uh, bounds of the true configuration space regions. So this is just one example of a surprisingly tight, you know, 7.33 millimeters gap of a separating hyperplane that was found between these two um, bimanual manipulators. They're they're kind of surprisingly good. So let me this is just let me try to tell you what this up this visualization is. So. Um, <clears throat> So it's hard to visualize configuration space regions. One of the ways, I, which I did very quickly, I'm embarrassed we're still using it, but was just to um, basically pick a random direction in configuration space, project to the edge of the polyhedral in that space, in that, and then pick another random direction and just kind of take a random walk around the faces of the polygon in order to visualize that. That's what's happening here. It's just walking around the interior of the configuration space region. But what you'll see is that it's, even though the mug is an obstacle and the fingers of the robot are, are um, considered in the optimization, it's able to find configuration space regions that are large, but are also include like around the mug, right? So normally motion planners do all kinds of configuration, you know, collision-free motion planning, but then when they actually go to pick something up, something there's always something gross in the algorithm where you sort of assume collision geometry is not not available or something like this, but this is going right up to and um, right before the collision. So the proposal here is to do something like that looks like sample based motion planning, but um, where most people are are just filling configuration space with samples. We're basically saying every time you pick a sample, let's do a little bit more work. Let's grow an entire region 
And that gives room so that you're not just restricted to finding paths that are along this, this discrete graph um, with straight line edges, but it gives room for a continuous optimization to do find beautiful curves with continuity constraints, derivative constraints, um, and the like. And we can use optimization to solve this well. And the certificates are that they're globally optimal and complete, if you like, within the convex op decomposition. So there's gaps if we haven't filled the configuration-free space. There's gaps on the degree of the polynomials you decide to optimize over in there. But within that class of curves, we can, we can understand global optimality. We've done a bunch of comparisons with PRMs and like to say that we're able to solve better paths a little bit faster than the standard implementations. Um, so there's open geometry problems here, right? So we don't yet understand rigorously what defines an optimal convex decomposition for this planner. Um, I think it's closely related to some of the problems you guys know, maximum vertex hidden set problems and visibility graphs. We're looking looking at those connections to see if we can make some statement about optimal coverage. There's subtle cost benefits of overlapping regions and subtle trade-offs between coverage and complexity of the sets. We've got some cool work on extending it to non-Euclidean geometry where we um, don't have to worry about uh, wraparound effects and we can handle mobile manipulators can handle mobile bases that have a non-Euclidean configuration space. Going around, you know, don't worry about wrap around and two pi and the like. We're starting to do task and motion planning with the same kind of algorithms. I think the discrete power of the combinatorial optimization plays very well with task and motion planning and multimodal motion planning. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just go quickly through that. Um, yeah, so we focus today on graph of convex sets for motion planning. Uh, it's a more general modeling framework um, for traveling salesman problems, other network flow problems. You can bring some continuous structure into those problems and solve and leverage some of the strength of both the well-known discrete optimization and, and some of the continuous optimization. Uh, this is version 1.0 of the framework. Um, it's competitive in, in many problems and we're providing a mature implementation, but there's a lot more work to do. We're adding support for more costs and constraints, making it easier to generate the decompositions, working on a custom solver, um, looking at warm starting, all kinds of solutions. So maybe I'll, Danny, should I stop there? Is it a 10 o'clock hard stop or is it? A... No, you can continue, just leave some time to questions before 5.10. Uh, okay, good, good. Okay, then I'll, I have a few more slides. I'll go. That's sure. great. Thank you. Um, all of that is available in our open source software, Drake, um, which is a, a simulator, but also a, provides these optimization codes. So this is our kind of state of the art um, physical simulator for, for manipulation, which has interesting contact models, interesting geometry problems inside it. But it also exposes all of the equations for, for instance, rational kinematics and optimization. And the graph of convex sets is this in this general machinery is now available in the open source package should be available to use. Um, yeah, so, so that's the basic story. We have a new strong mixed integer convex formulation for shortest path problems over convex regions. It reduces to the shortest path as regions become points. The class of problems that it's considering is certainly NP-hard, but the instances that seem to be uh, appearing in real problem motion planning problems uh, tend to be very tight. Statistically, we almost we basically never solve the convex optimization problem. Actually, in, it's interesting in the um, in the multimodal motion planning, the task and motion planning instances. The first time we tried like moving lots of boxes around maybe an Amazon kind of problem. Um, uh, the convex relaxations were very loose when we formulated them as shortest path, but then we realized that we were that the network flow was wrong. And what we actually needed to solve was a traveling salesman problem there. We wrote the traveling salesman formulation of the graph optimization. We brought the convex sets geometry uh, machinery into the TSP, and then we got very tight um, solutions. I showed you some initial applications and manipulator planning at dynamic limits. 
but I think there's much more um, available there. And I'm generally excited about the sort of connection between trajectory optimization, sample plan based planning, but also trying to get the large scale logical planning. There's definitely the versions that I've showed you are taking the entire graph, putting it in memory, handing it to the optimizer. And that's not what people do at very large scale planning problems. They solve incremental heuristic versions of this and all of that machinery should be applied here too. And, and many of the strong results from combinatorial optimization, I think there's a more natural connection now. We've exposed some of the, you know, the ways to think about network flow in the trajectory optimization problems. <laughs> okay, that's it. So um, I have a couple of classes online uh, that have more of this kind of material if people are interested, but I would love to hear your, your questions and your thoughts. So does uh, uh, this type of method work with a lot of robots because the configuration space become very big and uh, can you develop these convex structures? I didn't really understand how you grow these, these uh, ellipsoids. Um, does it work for multi-robots planning? It's a great question. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple natural ways that you could, you could think about the multi-robot planning problem. I think if you just put N robots with interesting geometries into the problem, you will be sad that the <laughs> convex decomposition, you know, finding large convex regions in the very high dimensional space is probably not the problem you want to solve. Of course, you could approximate that. So having dynamic ops, treating, um, you know, only your closest neighbors, you know, somehow putting a bound on the total number of closest neighbors would allow you to bound the, the dimension of the configuration space. And then you could also think about including dynamic obstacles. So any agents that were above and beyond you know, the, the assumption of, of numbers of neighbors could be treated as dynamic obstacles. And we have ways where we're thinking about online shrinking of convex sets. But I do think that the machinery as is would give you a way for small numbers of distributed agents to take their, their Cartesian product configuration space, their geometries and come up with convex sets in that space. So like the multiple spheres in the plane is doing exactly that. I have another question. Can you Great. say something about um, the uh, the sim to real gap? Because you showed us uh, simulate different simulators, and I've been struggling a lot with simulators that have been producing uh, erroneous errors and vice versa. You know, like simulation was more was not. You know, we had less errors in the real world, and vice, and also of course the other way. And I was wondering how do you kind of quantify the the um, the uh, you know the um, value of your models that are used to kind of you know for the, your simulations. Excellent. So um, so we have a particular simulation tool chain which is this which is implemented in Drake. There's a particular so if you care about models with contact, um, I mean there's a, there's a handful of really good simulators out there. I think um, you know Mujoko and Nvidia are have emphasized the RL workflow and optimized for speed have sacrificed the sim to real gap in that. Drake has maybe stubbornly worked on the sim to real gap and hasn't optimized for speed yet. Well, well we're starting to do that now. Um, one of the places, for instance, where you can see limitations of the, of the choices that people make for the fast solvers is in the, con the way they treat um, geometry. Uh, so typically, I won't leave that on playing over and over again, but um, when you talk about two bodies overlapping, right? A lot of times, most solvers will summarize that contact, that rigid contact with one point or, or a, a, hand, a small number of points, um, and then try to find forces that will resist penetration at that one point or some small number of points. Um, many of them only, if even if, if you see like simulations of thousands of blocks falling down, they're actually only solving the constraints for a very small fraction of those boxes. So, so they're actually not resisting penetration. And even the choice to use point contact models, often it's very hard to choose those points consistently. The, the computational geometry problem that people are solving there is not done very well. Um, the points can jump discontinuously and that can lead to erroneous large forces that cause us into real gap. Mm -hmm. So the choices we've made have been to do some more work in the computational geometry to actually compute surface integrals across a membrane that's effectively um, doing the a surface integral across that geometry. And it gives much smoother, much more reliable contact forces and has really closed the sim to real gap for us. 
uh, we've done at Toyota Research Institute, we've done a lot of work on Cinderella. We had a, a project of loading dishes where we really tried to get to the point where we're running Monte Carlo in simulation, we're running Monte Carlo in hardware, we're getting into the nines of reliability. And anytime the hardware failed and the simulation didn't fail, we would fix it. And, and we really got a very high level. So my confidence in terms of the, the, I mean, you still have to get the assets in to appropriate um, fidelity, which can be a tall order, but the, the, I think our ability to simulate the equations is very good. I really want to adapt all this machinery. I have one small concern about the guarantees. And did you think, what can you say? Can you give guarantees on the quality of the approximation relative to the missing parts? Namely, uh, you are not covering everything. You are right. leaving holes some places. Right. But suppose you know something about the holes. You know, you know something about their diameter or anything. Yes. Can you yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think there's a, there's a lot of potential to to give those types of bounds. We haven't done it yet, but I think the yeah I think you're exactly what you said. There's 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 ways forward to talk about um, if you if you put assumptions on the 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 gap in the convex coverage, uh, what can that tell you about the the worst case deviation of the optimal path? I think all of those things are potentially possible, but would require further investigation. Um, yeah, we've been more interested in, you know, just as a personal bias of trying to get it to scale first and then closing those gaps second, but that's just our style. 